Oh no. What? Since the broadcast is live. It's live. It said uh we're having trouble connecting. Oh no. So I was like, no, but we are live. So <coughs> thanks everyone for joining us. It is the first edition of the round table discussions for 2023. And uh I'm joined by Remy from Rem's Family Farm. Chris from Hickory Croft and Mike from Me and You Acres. Are you guys doing awesome tonight? I'm doing great. Good. Everything's Good. covered in ice. <laughs> yeah. Doing good. It, we're, uh, we're the opposite. Everything's pretty much melting <laughs> or melting. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a little mild over there, eh? Yeah, it's been pretty mild so far this winter, which is not terrible. No, no, exactly. But it's going to get cold eventually. It's been a little bit warmer than usual here as well. But we're still like minus uh, 6 to minus 10 Celsius. Usually this time of year, people go ice fishing. But there's no way that it's not safe ice fishing right now. It's just put it this way. Yeah. Well, I've seen my daughter's was... been out ice fishing a bit. But uh, I don't know if they've actually really gone out with like the vehicles or anything. Or just gone out on the shore sort of thing so okay yeah well, the, uh, did you guys get hit with the ice storm last night not last night but the last few days we got some so we had about an hour of freezing rain where we are but if you drove 20 minutes north of us they had like a full-on ice storm so we basically just got rain ah <laughs> oh, ouch yeah no. No, it blew my uh, satellite dish all askew. I was out in the, the freezing rain trying to reset it, and, and oh. everything's covered in ice today. I heard uh, trees falling and snapping in half. Yeah, yeah, we went out for a walk, and cutting some paths with the snowmobile for the trails, and uh, noticing all the trees that are down now, all the branches that are broken off. So it's already... Uh, been a rough winter for the uh, vegetation yeah no. looks like we got uh, a bunch of people in the house tonight uh not sure if alpine preparedness is still here but thanks for dropping by uh patrick is in the house marilyn little homestead by the beach uh gear gridden dave knight the Mud Booker and Tracy at T Hand 141. Good to see you guys. Welcome. Glad you could make it. So, besides the weather that you guys are dealing with, have you faced any other issues, surprises that have come up this year so far due to the weather or due to <laughs> other natural? For me, it's usually this time of year, it's cold enough and we have snow. So I can feed the animals some snow. Like you, you give them water, it freezes right away. But this year, for some reason, like it's been cold, but we don't have much snow, which is a good thing for my, my brain, but not so much for the animals because like can't really give them anything to drink. Um, there's no snow and water freezes right away. So it's been tough on that end. But beside that, I mean, um, Everything's great. Yeah, everything's been good over here. Uh, a little wet from time to time. And then uh, I've been the only one around with a tractor for the most part. So when we had the big snowfall, I uh, spent four hours plowing everybody out. <laughs> I noticed that in your one video, you're making the rounds. Yes, yes. Do you have uh, snow chains for that one or no? No. And, no. Um, Currently, I have it up uh, on Marketplace because I'm looking for a 4x4 uh, four four tractor so I can have better traction. Okay, um, yeah. There are hills and stuff around here that I can't get up and down after I take my first pass because then it's just ice or slick underneath. Yeah. Um, so if I can get a 4x4 four four tractor, then it can help out more. and It'll st still do everything I need to do around here, so. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was on the horse farm, we had a bigger tractor, uh, two-wheel drive. You put even putting chains on the back sometimes, you get a good ice and you're still sliding. 
chains mm -hmm. chains aren't helping as much as you think they are in some conditions. I know uh, we've had kind of a, well, we're only a little bit into the year, but it's kind of been a weird uh, winter so far because for us because we're at that zone where we've been getting fairly warm weather. Um, so usually, like what you said, Remy, by this time you can feed the animals snow or they have access to snow, that sort of thing. We got that big dump of snow kind of right before Christmas, which was good and bad for different reasons, but then it's all melted and we're back to mud season, which isn't fantastic on the sheep and whatnot because nothing's growing. So you just have mud. <laughs> um, so not necessarily what you would think of as a winter problem, but that's the, that's the way of it at the moment. Yeah. Are you finding a lot of mud too, Remy, or is it? Uh, are you staying cold enough that uh, you're sticking mostly with ice so far? No, everything's frozen. Um, yeah. There's no mud. If we don't, we, we have enough snow that we don't see the grass or the ground anywhere. Uh, but I mean, usually this time of year we have a few feet of snow, and right now like, it's maybe like this much snow and it's frozen solid. So there's nothing we can do with it really like we can i know there's some people doing snowmobile but it's i'm guessing it would be hard on the on the machines um like i said we can't go ice fishing the kids can't really go sled because not enough snow like there's always a uh, few plants coming out of the snow they're still not like fully died yet right now. yeah um i don't know it's just it's weird um i don't mind it Personally, except for the fact that I struggle a little bit more to, you know, for the animals, it's a little bit harder. But besides that, like I, I think we've had the last the last winter we had that was like this was back in 2010, because I remember we were uh, moving in our temporary house um, in the city not too far from here, and I remember just putting stuff on the uh, on the ground like the all the the libraries and stuff like that and just letting it slide down to the basement which is going straight down um, we didn't have to to lift it up or nothing like that it was was pretty easy um, but you know I'm not moving so I don't need that the kind of weather I uh, just melt already and I'm ready to plant some seeds <laughs> have you guys without the snow that we normally have are you guys worried at all about um, vegetation so like any trees getting damaged from not having that insulation on or plants not being insulated like they should? It, it's been like that before. And uh, I mean, the, the trees survived. Of course, there's always a few plants that are gonna, gonna die. But in general, I mean, I, this, that, this kind of winter we have happens every maybe 10, 15 years. Yeah, so it's not really something that we'd never see. It's just something that's not necessarily the tendency that we've seen in the last uh, few years. Because lately, in the past maybe five years, we used to have a lot of snow, and it can change quite fast. Like we can, we can wake up in two weeks from now and have like two, three storms, and you know we would have a very different conversation right now. So, yeah. What about you, Chris? You seen any of that, or yeah? <sighs> Well, because we're on the warm side, we haven't even really had frost into the ground very far. Like we, we might have been lucky to have, you know, that much for a little bit of time. So um, the weird part, and I've tracked oh. it for a few years because we have a, um, a red maple that's right behind the barn. And uh, when it warms up, it will look like it's going to butt out. And then when it gets cold again, the buds will re will uh, retract and kind of go back to the what looks like a dormant state. And I, I find that fascinating <laughs> because the tree doesn't seem to have any problem with it. But uh, that seems to happen a lot when you have this up and down, up and down. I don't really know what the long-term forecast is for us. Right. But you know, we're going to get more snow at some point because the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario are wide open right now so there's a lot of moisture sitting there to to dump on us again so it's going to happen <laughs> yeah and then getting that snow cover before it gets cold again which is 
what will probably happen really helps with that. We, we've uh, noticed some of the plants, like even our celery and stuff, that we didn't get protected and we thought was just going to be lost is still alive and still not growing, but it's still alive. So if it kind of keeps up like this, who knows, it might, uh, it might actually be better for it. Yeah. We had issues last year with uh, some of the trees we planted, the young ones. Uh, we noticed the ones that were sticking out above the top of the snow uh, got the, the cold damage on them. Yeah. Good what job. about you, Mike? Any issues at all with snow? <laughs> I had a... Besides clearing it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I built up like a 20-foot tall uh, snow pile and had the kids digging in it. Um, that's half melted now. Um, the only thing we have back here growing right now is the apple tree we've kind of built the homestead around. And we had pruned that, uh, pruned it up pretty good and cleaned up around it so now it's not getting choked out um so i'm hoping that it's not going to get damaged we'll get some uh apples from it next year we had a ton this year actually so that was good nice. and i mean it's clearing out the forest for me it's breaking <laughs> trees and <laughs> all i gotta do is keep the chainsaw going and clearing things out uh ellie dan had a question for you how much would you spend on a tractor uh, well, out here, I need a tractor to do everything. So I need uh, a four by four because it's got to go up and down, you know, some pretty steep hills and get into some pretty, you know, angry areas. <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking around 25 to 35 is usually where you'd end up. You could go as high as you want, but uh, that's pretty much where you want to be. So, something around. 30 horsepower, somewhere in that range, I would imagine. Nice. Just want to say hi to Passamaquoddy. Thanks for dropping by. Food Forest Permaculture. Uh, Ellie Dan, of course. Um, Permistead on Cooper. Thanks for dropping by as well. So is it with the mud and the ice and that kind of stuff happening, is there anything you guys would change for next year or future years uh, to kind of prevent any issues you're having now? Or is it really that much of an issue or you're just going to sort of deal with it? And... I think no matter how much you prepare, there's always something coming uh, your way. Like you can prepare as much as you want. You can have – uh, 30 bags of salt and you're gonna have like a bunch of snow instead of ice so to me it's just like as long as you have a plan i don't like to say plan b because really if it's only a matter of if something happens you know what to do kind of thing um i, I can't really change anything because if there was more snow i would just give more snow to the animals if there was uh, more ice i would just try to bring more water and you know try not to have it freeze as fast but i i've purchased uh one of those uh warmer water before and every time i was trying to put water in it it was just opening up and i was getting splashed with water and um i got so mad at some point that i just threw it as hard as i could on the wall <laughs> and uh obviously it's not working anymore so <laughs> it's uh you know it's just a matter for me of uh being aware of what can happen and have a plan in my mind like i don't really write stuff down so as, as long as i have an idea of what to do and i mean being a homesteader is all about you know facing different challenges and being ready for whatever comes so uh, we've been through it all uh around here we've had huge snowstorms uh where last year i had to shovel my way to the rabbits like twice in a storm uh, because they were buried in the snow um, you know, to having uh, rain in the winter where everything was just, uh, you know, free, frozen rain and uh, everything was freezing down and everything happens. So you just have to be ready for no matter what. And there's, there really isn't anything that would change because, like I said, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> what about yourself, Mike? Anything you'd change? Uh, yeah, well, I happened this year. I, I have plans for irrigation 
<laughs> and drainage. <laughs> um, I found that things roll downhill into my like driveway area in between the house and the barn. And when I plowed downhill, I blocked all the water from going anywhere further than that area. So I've got to put in some clear stone. Uh, so I'm going to trench it out, put in some uh, some pipe and some clear stone and have a French drain put in right across my driveway. Um, so that hopefully should take care of a lot of stuff. I do have some other plans to um, ditch down my driveway so it rolls off and make a little creek. And Angie wants to put a little uh, bridge across it, I don't know, like a four or five foot bridge. She's going to get fancy with it, I'm sure. <laughs> that, that, uh, that all sounds very reasonable. <laughs> I think uh, we just have, I'm going to say, a bunch of mostly smaller things. So one thing that we did do this year, or started to do, was we can't gravel all the pathways that we have, but we have some areas that we travel a lot. And so we've started to gravel, I don't know, but a three or four foot wide path on some of those areas. And that's made a pretty big difference um, to at least those high traffic areas. Um, one thing, although we're not really having to worry about it right now, is we have a lot of temporary gates, <laughs> okay. which basically sit on the ground, which when you get snow, so this is the opposite to mud, when you get the snow or when the ground freezes because you start to get that shifting and heaving as it as the frost goes in right then the gates don't work so as we get into building everything permanently one thing we always do is to make sure there's some space whether you've got a four by four under it if you don't want like chicks or something going under so that you're above sort of ground level or whether you just have the gate lifted up it's another silly little thing um the other the other two are bigger. One would be more fencing, more permanent fencing, because with the sheep, when we get this melt, we've actually been running uh, our younger ewe lambs, so the ones that we're not breeding this year, we've been running them back to pasture because there's not that many of them, and then they don't chew everything up. It's working really well, but if you had more permanent fencing, because using the temporary electric fence right now is not ideal uh, when you're getting that freeze thaw that would be a big thing and on the flip side more covered areas because with the sheep again when you get so much rain and then you get freezing rain and then you get the thaw and all this other stuff they can handle it but the fleece felts or mats right so right. then you're basically the winter fleece isn't as nice as the summer slash fall fleece but you still don't want to lose it to the elements so it would almost be better if it just got cold and stayed that way right so this True. Up and down. uh just want to say hey to uh vanessa kitty mountain roots uh who else did i see come in here uh um, a few people joined sarah came in thanks guys for joining us really appreciate that um with you guys and the gates how do you guys manage it with snow? Like, do you have fixed gates? Do you have um, kind of like we've got the uh, just wire gates. So it's on the bungee handles. Um, how do you guys manage fixed gates? If you have them with the snow, do you shovel them out every time it snows or do you leave them and climb over them or what? uh <laughs> What's your solution for the gates? I don't have any gates. No? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I shovel mine out That's all the That's the time. solution. Not have any. <laughs> no, no gates, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now the only one I've got is for the dog pen. And uh, I've got that about a foot up off the ground to help. But I also I shovel it out because like, yeah. the last snowfall was probably around two feet. So. I'm going to be the complicated, awkward one because we've got a bunch of things going on. <laughs> so, some of the anything we use regularly, um, if you get 
decent snowfall, we do uh, shovel at least in front of it so you can swing it open. Yeah. It's, if you do it kind of as the snow's coming down or shortly thereafter, it's not usually too bad. Um, yeah. But if they're permanent, one thing we actually do, at least in the high traffic areas, so when we're talking like back on the pasture fences, we wouldn't do this, but some of the gates that go into the gardens or right by the barn, uh, I like putting a four by four at the bottom. And okay. sometimes we'll actually build like an up and over because then that just holds the the fence post together, right? So that your gate stays relatively square in case Instead it's Instead of sagging but down. By putting that four by four there, you've always got that little lip, right? So it's not a huge lip, but it's enough to give you a bit of a buffer. Right. Um, the other thing we do is we have some that are made out of cattle panels. So what we tend to do is a temporary fix is baler twine. They're attached on what the one side that they sort of pivot on with baler twine, and then you can kind of lift them up out of it. So you okay. still have to push it away, but as long as it doesn't get frozen in, that's where the 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 fast freeze is absolutely horrible because everything freezes up and you you have to like bust it open. But as long as you don't get that, it's it's not too bad. Right, right. Do you use those gates for? the sheep or do you use like the cattle panel just kind of as kind of like a, an aisle way, like a backup gate to the other fence? Um, there is. <laughs> Short answer is both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have, uh, I guess it would be like the main gate going back the channel to the pastures right now is just a, a half of a cattle panel with a full cattle panel on the other side because we haven't permanently set that area up yet. We've okay. done one side. It's hard to visualize, but basically you've got the aisle and we've got a permanent building and pen on one side, but we haven't finished the other side yet. So we just have the, the panels just with uh, T-posts. And it's actually been there for at least two years now, this setup. And it, it, it works, but uh, it's not ideal. Right. Is there uh, stuff that you guys uh, didn't get done in time for the winter? Uh, did you miss something? Did you not get uh, like us? We totally miss getting firewood. We were too busy with other stuff. So we'll have to probably do that next week. Finally. Uh, I... Gas. We only had a bit of gas for the generator when the power went out. Thankfully it didn't stay out too long, which was nice. So <laughs> Angie's saying the cabin uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for me, really, it's only stuff in the garden. Um, I have, I still have about maybe I'm guessing roughly 50 pounds of carrots in my garden. Um, but it's not a big deal because I can still harvest it in, uh, in the spring. Um, you know, I didn't have time to harvest my sunflowers. I didn't have time to harvest all my celery um and a, a few things like that i still have uh well i didn't have time to harvest uh, mint lavender uh, chamomile everything is still out there in the garden um it's gonna grow back in in the spring hopefully uh, but yeah that's pretty much all i didn't have time to do like i wanted to do a lot more uh, preservation as well um i lost a few zucchinis and a few squash because i didn't have time to to care for them but beside that uh, nothing major I, i'm surprised because there's seems to be more stuff that i'm finding that will actually overwinter quite well for example our leeks we found that if we left our leeks they would come back next year uh, i don't know whether it's just because the deep snow or what it is insulating them so this fall I actually planted some leeks and tried to do it like winter wheat. So get it going. And then hopefully in spring, that'll kickstart it and be going again. Um, is the carrots and stuff something that uh, like the following year, it's, it's still pretty good or have you noticed a difference or will this be the first time harvesting the carrots after winter? Um, I did it last last year and harvested some in the spring uh, the problem i have here is mice uh, they tend to go and chew on them so i Cat. have to throw them out uh, i was lucky a little well i don't consider myself really lucky it's just that i had maybe 
uh, five pounds that I was able to harvest. So that's maybe like three lunches for me. Um, that's the thing. Uh, I see Angie's mentioning it as well, that I can leave it in the ground for, for seeds. Um, the problem is if uh, the rodents eat it, well, I lose everything. So, But the ones that I have in the ground that I, that I was able to harvest are way better than anything else I've ever had uh, for carrots. Really good. I don't know. It's like it has more taste. Tastes better. A little sweeter. Know. Little yeah. sweeter. Nice. And... We find just to interject for a second. We find that with the wild parsnips because okay, um, we don't purposely grow them, but we have a lot of them here, and we tend to dig them up in the spring. Just as you start to get the rosette coming up, you go around and dig them up, and uh, they're quite good. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and I see uh, potatoes too are another one that uh, is always good. You can, um, as Mountain Roots mentioned, mulch them and dig them out as you need them. Uh, for us, we can't do that just because of the amount of snow. Those ones will usually stay in there. And then uh, next year, we'll be uh, getting more potatoes. So, ah, Mud Booker, thank you. That's a uh, little cowbell here. That's really appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I don't think there's much that I didn't get done. No. <laughs> <laughs> I tried getting the tractor up because uh, I cleared a bunch of land up there uh, on the hill above the cabin for uh -huh. Angie's garden where she wanted to put the garden. And I tried to get the backhoe up there, and I just kept digging ruts into the hillside and never quite made it up there to dig up all the the stumps, so I didn't get the the gar. I didn't get the doors in the house. I didn't get the windows in the house. I didn't get the insulation in the house. Uh, <laughs> I had over. I, I became overzealous on my driveway and kept dropping more gravel, more gravel, and got it flat and perfect and great. And then it rained, and I realized everything was just heading straight straight for the barn and in the house and so i had to like dig that all up and <laughs> try and bring the grade of the the driveway down about a, a half a foot <laughs> so i had enough that i built like a two car uh parking spot right next to the barn so much gravel i had left over uh shoot there's there's tons there's just tons i'm i'll be working for years <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it never ends really it no no ends. exactly yeah uh welcome digs outdoors and scrambles good to see you guys hope you're having a great night yeah there's always big things that are always ongoing always got to get done it's it's just that to-do list that never ends never uh never an end to it until you stop no. Doing this yeah. stuff. <laughs> oh man, Dave it, Knight. It's, it's worse. Is, Thank you. <laughs> that's so cool. You'll you'll think you got everything right the way you want it, and then you'll sit down and have a coffee on the porch and look and be like, you know what'd be cool? <laughs> <laughs> if I just did that there. If I, if I put a fence up here, I could do this. Just it never ends. Never ends. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Anything that you uh forgot to do that you should have done? Well, I'm going to start with some positivity and say that <laughs> I, others may disagree, but I think this year we actually did better on getting a lot of stuff sorted out. Um, like when you mentioned wood, we got the wood. We have more wood than we need. Now, did we get it all in the woodshed? No, but it is tar. <laughs> so it's not the end of the world. Like it's, it's not like it's sitting out, but um uh, we still have, uh, we never got our mango beets out of the garden. That was one that uh, they won't last the winter if we don't get them out. So we're kind of hoping with this bit of warm up, we can get them out. That's a livestock food. But still, we use the space. Uh, I'm trying to think anything major. We wanted to get more gravel down, but ran out of time because the snow stopped us. Um, we had a project underway that we got it up and standing but that's as far as we got 
So I don't know if I really put that in the category of we didn't get it done or we were just hoping that we'd have enough time to maybe get it done. <laughs> so I, we, I think we've taken a little bit of a slower because because we had such a long, mild December, we, I'm not going to say we slowed down, but we protracted things out a bit. So like after Christmas, we still had to process some of our geese. And so we've got that job done. We still actually have a few rabbits because we keep going, well, the rabbits we can do in a short period of time. So let's keep tackling bigger things. And we just keep pushing it off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but we're kind of getting to that point where, yeah, there's not too short of starting something completely big and new. There's not too much left. I don't yeah, think. you mentioned the geese, and I was just remembering that we now have, I think there's four roosters, three maybe four roosters that we have to harvest now, that uh, you know hatched late summer, or maybe it was summer, but now they're uh, they're daddy. big, and we were in changing the water, and it's like at certain times you can't tell them apart from our big guy and it's like oh yeah yeah then you look at the legs in the chest and it's like yep yeah you you're done you got to go soon. The meal. yeah yeah i don't know if they're going to be as big a meal i think they're all fluffy and puffy because it's winter but um it's yeah, it's going to be a meal good. anyway yeah yeah exactly i'm i'm sick of the meat and the feed in there I was like, I can only afford so much feed. Stop eating it, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got uh, Robert Castleberry and Cat Mac who just joined us. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Hope you're doing amazing tonight. Um, so I'll, with, I'll segue it for a second because you yeah. brought up the topic about um, uh, the plants overwintering. Yeah. And I can't 100% prove this, and maybe somebody will will chime in here, but some of the plants that are like the biannuals, um, and it could be just I just haven't researched it enough, but something that we have been finding is if you start something in the spring and you plant it out and it has like that whole growing season, depending on what it is, some of them don't overwinter as well as smaller versions. So when you, when you said about okay. the leaves and planting them out and then hope, seeing what happens, I'll be interested to see what happens because you, they may actually do really well. But then I was thinking about it in terms of our kale, when our kale went to seed, the kale went to seed. And of course that was like late or summer, not September, but like August -y sort of thing, right? When they dried out and they popped open, but then all that seed that we didn't collect pops open, falls on the ground and all that seed starts to grow. And then this year, I mean, we saw some last year, but they would have been just tiny little plants. And then this year we had kale plants everywhere below the beds that had fallen on the ground and stuff and overwintered beautifully. And it makes me think that when you have like that yearly cycle for some of those plants that we call biannuals, that the cycle actually is from like late summer through to the next year when they go to seed, which would probably be why it's like brassicas, right? They do well in cool season. They don't do so well in the hot. So if you yeah. start in the spring as little starts and they go outside by the time you get to middle of summer, they probably won't make it through the year. Whereas if you do it the other way around, when we did our cabbage too, we planted it in the fall as tiny little starts and then it didn't do too much, overwintered and then grew beautifully. So you're probably onto something. <laughs> yeah. I kind of noticed it this summer, uh, spring, summer kind of thing. Cause we had leaks that we never pulled out last year. Uh, we were planning to, and then we got hit with an early kind of frost freeze, ice rain that last year. So we kind of just left them. And this year they came back. Well, they didn't really come back. They were already, almost fully grown and they just kept growing from that. And we were like, oh, they probably won't be good. So we were moving the beds and redesigning the garden anyway. So we scooped it all out, moved the soil. And then basically we took the, the root balls and the leaks and everything and just threw them around on the lawn and other places where we've continued to try and improve the soil. 
So you could almost do it like a permaculture uh, chop and drop. We took that kind of stuff that was like the, the roots and the stems and everything and just threw it on where we were dropping and chopping and mulching and other stuff. They just kept growing. So later in the summer, we've got leeks and onions and other stuff growing up in the middle of the food forest. So it was like, oh, now we can go out and harvest a leek, harvest an onion from the food forest that was over in the raised bed last year. So this year it's a little going to be a little trial and error where I planted those leeks. They started growing. They've gotten established. So hopefully they'll overwinter and get a lot bigger this summer. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, we're just yeah. looking at the comments. Definitely agree with the mud broker that with the seeds. Some of them do need that stratification. And like he says, it's mostly the woody plants that you have to put them through. There's actually a few that need multiple years. The uh, the viburnums, like the highbush cranberry and, and wild yes. raisins, they actually need two seasons of cold stratification, which is crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. I uh, saw Redbird Farm and CR came in. Creative Redundancy. Good to see you guys. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Tracy had a question there. Uh, are you guys doing a roundtable at the conference, right? I think uh, potentially. I, I think <laughs> oh, that last is time. the plan. Yeah. As far as we know, um, when is the date on that? So if anyone's in Ontario, uh, it's going to be in Lanark County. What is it? May 6th. May 6th, Lanark County, uh, Eastern Ontario Homesteading Conference. So we're all going to be there. Uh, we'll probably be uh, all up on stage for sure at some point talking. But uh, we'd love to see everyone there and get to chatting and talking as well. Yeah. McDonald's yeah. Corner, I think it's called, right? Yeah. Yeah, the venue's a little different place. Very close. It's not that far, but uh, from where it was last year. Oh, yeah? Okay. I bet no. I asked. The, you said the, the, the wild raisins and something else takes two years. Do they come back then every year? Uh, well, they're, they're woody plants. So their viburnums are like a bush. The, okay. uh, there's a bunch of different species. Um, but those two, the wild raisin and the, I can't remember the scientific name, and the highbush cranberry. It's not a real cranberry, but it's very cranberry-like. Uh, they're edible. So they're, they're, they're nice ones for, for that perspective, but they get to be about a 10 to 10 to 15 foot bush. Like they're, they're decent size. Okay. Um, yeah. Just, the wild reason we just found on the property this year. They're yeah. they're I actually really like them. We didn't, uh, we didn't have much in the way of fruit from them this year. Cause we have quite a few in some of the old fence rows, but uh, it kind of tastes like a weird, it's like a berry that has a banana type flavor to it. I don't know how to describe it. Okay. I'm thinking that one is one that uh, they said you should cook or should should do something with instead of just eating it raw. Is that not the, the high bush cranberry? Uh, might it, be that one too. It's it's the one the high bush cranberry tends to taste a little better after it's been frosted or been yeah. by a frost, but then it's not really. They don't taste great, <laughs> but you can cook Vi them into things. Viburnum nudum, I think, but it doesn't look like. Uh, yeah, there it is. Viburnum nudum is the wild raisin. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we, we were uh, out trimming stuff on the, um, in the backwoods, taking out trees, taking down dead stuff and all that. Um, and it was in the fall, right when all these uh, berries are on it. So I was like, whoa, what is that? I've never seen that before. That's awesome. And I've got, uh, what is it? Seek? A little app oh, on yes. the phone, you take a yep. picture and it tells you what it is. And I'm like, I love this. And then we found another one out there too. And I'd say they're both maybe four feet high, something like that. So yeah. Two two interesting things on the on the app. 
just just as a biologist <laughs> use it as a tool but i'm sure in that case it got it to the right species but always check it oh because I... it doesn't it, it it's good they're good but they're not perfect yeah as, a, as an I, fyi um, i triple check stuff i'm like you know i'm not uh having gut rot for a week and that sort of stuff i'm like no i'm i make sure you know i want to check if i'm out foraging for anything yeah. even mm, even sometimes stuff. touching stuff i'm like stuff could literally uh, kill you so you have to be careful yeah that's just it so I'm I'm careful sometimes, like just touching leaves and that kind of stuff. I'm like, you never know. Sometimes, well, I don't anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> Chris, you probably know a lot better than I do. So, oh, I don't know everything. <laughs> um, the other thing about the the, the wild raisins of viburnums and stuff, if you come across them when you're clearing, if they're somewhere that you can can leave them. One thing you can do is, uh, like, if they're small, because that's four feet good size, but still yeah. on the smaller end of things, you can release them, like, get rid of all the competition immediately around them. Okay. It's amazing how much growth you'll get. Like, we did that with some high bush cranberries, and I actually should go and check and see if they have berries on them. But we didn't even know, same thing, we didn't know they were there because we hadn't walked down into this one area. And so I was going through, and we were cutting out uh, young... Uh, European buckthorns to just eradicate them and uh, we came across a couple of these little guys and I'm like oh well we'll just kind of clear everything out right around them so that you know come comes summer they don't have a lot of competition and it was crazy how much they flowered and everything after even that first year nice we'll take some more pines and stuff down around them because they're in a spot where they're going to stay mm -hmm. so we'll just clean up <coughs> around them give them more sun, give them more, uh, less competition. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of the one part of like permaculture. You don't, I know this is very far for winter stuff, but it's like <laughs> the one part of permaculture you don't hear about a lot, right. Is taking what you have and altering it that little bit so that it does better because if that species can provide you food or whatever, then, you know, maybe you don't want a whole forest of it, but a few but patches still, that you, yeah. uh, you tend and, keep really healthy just by doing simple things like that is a good idea. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So have you guys started to plant anything, started to do any seeds or anything? Are you looking forward to spring already? Do you have any plans that you're going to be working towards in the next month or two, or is it kind of just you're waiting three months before you really start getting into anything? I started doing uh, an inventory of all my seeds. I have an Excel document where I write down every type of seeds I have uh, from different company because different company will tell you different things. So I tend to write down what they tell me to do. Um, and then I looked on the Almanac website to, to see what my last frost date would be. Um, I put in my Excel document and I created something where everything is uh, calculated. Um, and then I can sort it out to see, okay, what's the first thing that I need to plant? And um, according to my document, oh, let's see if I, ha I have it open here. So I'm just going to interject for a sec there. And what they write, like you said, what they tell you to do isn't always what you need to do, especially no. on the seed <laughs> packets. No, and uh, it's always <laughs> like, a, you know, give or take a little bit. Um, you learn by experience and yeah. from, from what I could see here uh, in my document, it says, uh, for example, uh, Echinacea would be the first flower that I would need to plant if I wanted to have it ready uh, by spring. But then again, like I can plant it whenever I want and just let it grow outside and, you know, it grows when it grows, right? Um, I think the first thing I would actually need to plant would be like my onions and that would be like early March. So I don't have anything planned before early March. Um, but just to have the document there, it gives me like a guideline. It's nothing set in stone. Um, I always end up, you know, planning more stuff than I need to anyway and uh, faster than I should. 
but from what I learned last year, at least this year, like I know, I know what I'm going to eat. I know what I need. Um, I, I know that the amount of carrots, for example, is what I need for winter. Uh, but I know that I am far from being uh, okay with my potatoes. But I might have to plant more potatoes this year. I know that with my squash and zucchinis, I'm good with what I had this year. And I might have had even a little bit too much. Uh, I'll cut down on those a little bit and maybe plant some more tomatoes. You know, you, you get to learn by experimenting with all those kind of things. Mm. And, uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm still at the point of um, assessing what I had last year, what I think I need from this year. I didn't put my, my plan um, on paper yet. And it's something that I want to do, and that's something that I'm probably going to do uh, this month so that when it comes in February, uh, I can start to think, okay, I know what I'm going to plant. I know I have this area for, for this and this area for this. And um, I know if I need a certain amount of plants of tomatoes, well, I need to start at this time and try with those tomato plants instead of maybe these ones. You know, like I, I'm going to keep February for deciding which ones I want to do, but I want to keep January for deciding how many of which. I don't know if I'm, if you guys uh, follow up, yeah. but anyway. Yeah. Oh, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the potatoes. Uh, this year we've decided we, we're not going to do potatoes, which is kind of funny because I referenced back to other discussions we've all had about planting and growing things. And we've always talked about focusing more on stuff we can grow and that we do eat. And instead of like, you know, we grew fennel the one year. Well, we don't eat fennel. It was like, might as well grow some and try it, right? No, no, focus on. But we decided this year we're not going to grow potatoes. They do grow easily, but that's the thing. Every other farm in this area grows potatoes. So we figure we can go and get a 50 pound bag of potatoes anytime we want for a lot cheaper than it's going to cost us to grow. plant the potatoes, grow the potatoes, look after the potatoes, and then the space it needs as well. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's not ours, but I think we're going to be better off in this case. So, but that's, that's a, that makes sense given your situation because like you said if that's a if that's something that's readily available near you and you're you know you, i'm gonna say you can trust the source you're getting it from all that sort of stuff yeah then, then yeah that does make sense because it does take a lot of space we're yeah we're at the point where we can you know drive two minutes either way and start walking through fields and picking the potatoes up after they do the harvest because there's so many potatoes left on the ground too. So we're, yeah. we're the opposite on the potatoes because we kind of are looking at them going because nobody around us does grow them in any scale. Right. Um, but then they're I'm not going to say a substitute, but if we're, if we're cutting back a little bit on the grains and whatnot, then they're a decent substitute for that. Not completely, but that we can actually scale up a little bit. Yeah. I'm just hoping that I get this garden in so I don't get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm really looking forward to having like the salad garden all through the winter. That was my favorite. Um, that and I, sorry to say, I could eat potatoes every day. Every day. I just, yeah. So that would be yeah. my two go to. Angie wants to plant everything and grow everything. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we've got, uh, apple trees are going in this year. We've got two gardens at least that are going in this year. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> oh. Are you already starting to think about spring, Chris, or yeah, where so, are you at in your, yeah, I'm actually going to go to, uh, what Remy was saying about the spreadsheet. That's something that, uh, I want to sit down and do too, because, 
we've done a lot of the not all of it, but we've done a lot of experimenting. I just want it to keep track of like this is this is X variety, this is Y variety, because I can remember most of them. But every now and then, it's like, what kind of bean was that, <laughs> or what have you? So just the things were growing. Um, I think we're. I saw Dave. Uh, Dave Knight had a comment up there, but it just kind of slows down. I think we're kind of in the same boat. We've, we've really slowed down in the last little bit, but um, we've got some plans for some indoor stuff first. Uh, lettuce, we're, we're brought some little kale plants that I had intended to get planted out, never did. So they're like stunted, but we're gonna see how they do in the house. Um, and I'm gonna start some, uh, I have a dwarf hot pepper. We decided we're gonna start with again. So I'm gonna see if I can get them started but then after that it'll probably be the main pepper crop will be the next big one and then onions um yeah. i have to look at our seeds again before the end of last year i think we got pretty much everything we needed which wasn't a lot which included a few new things to try but uh we'll see <laughs> we'll reassess that, yeah. and that and not that it's edible by us, but I'm growing a lot of duckweed. <laughs> what is that one? Uh, it's that little tiny green plant that floats on the top of ponds. Okay, yeah. So I'm uh, supplementing on a very small scale right now, but the chickens diet with it. Nice, They're, nice. Uh, they do eat it okay, So, and it's supposed yeah. to be fairly high in protein for them. So You mentioned something about starting stuff in store, indoors and – that's one thing we want to do is I should have done it sooner, but um, we really want to up our indoor growing game. So figure out some way we don't keep the house that warm in the winter. So we have a lot of trouble actually with uh, our rosemary, keeping our rosemary alive. It, it always dies uh, when we bring it inside, but we'd love to have almost a dedicated room or, uh, one of those indoor grow tents, something like that, where we can get more herbs going, get more uh, salad going, that kind of stuff that we can pick and uh, pick from over the winter. That would be uh, ideal for us. If you've got the space that you can allocate to the room, I would probably recommend it because the, the tents are good, but you'll end up, Pretending, pretending on how big of a tent you get, you may end up wanting more space. <laughs> it's it's where we built a room, and I'm already talking about. Uh, well, I, I have expanded <laughs> unofficially. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> my my one thought would be uh, heating, kind of sticking like a little hot uh, heater in our cold room that I insulated for when we do the meat. Uh, do the cows and pigs and that sort of stuff. But I worry about possibility of almost getting some mold going or contaminating it a bit much to have the meat in there the following year. It, it's all kind of like it's the insulation with the silver lining on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure I could wipe it off and clean it off no problem. I just, you know. Yeah. I'm just trying to think you could definitely double duty it because one thing we find even with the led grow lights when you put them in a room and our our grow room I, you've probably seen it the very top we basically built the walls they only come about that high up and then it's all mesh okay so hot air always rises right but even though compared to the uh um fluorescent tubes the the led lights don't put off a lot of heat but they still when you can find it in a room, it still warms it up quite a bit. Um, so if you've got it insulated, that would probably work really well. But yeah, if you don't have a vent of some kind, there's, you might be there's, able to even just leave the door open. I, I'm thinking I could leave the door open or oh, turn the air conditioning unit on just a fan. But again, yeah. that would blow in the cold air. So, yeah. but. It's definitely possibility, so. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything you guys are having trouble dealing with in the winter? Like, do any of you get sick of the darkness? Um, or do you have um, 
you really hate going out to do the chicken water or feed the chickens or rabbit waters and stuff like that. Is that one of those, it's that time of year again, kind of attitude, or is it, uh, all of those you used to it, <laughs> all of those things. Um, yeah. I'm kind of person that uh, I love being outside. Um, on like I, I like being out in the garden in the nature uh, but I just hate the cold and I hate snow um, for me like I wish I could move in Florida or a place like that but then again I remember about the spiders and snakes and all that kind of stuff and I'm like okay well I I'll take the snow for for a little bit longer um, but yeah going out um, well, I don't know if it's just the fact that it's this time of year or just the fact that it's been like a long season. And then at this time of year, we're just like really tired and we're just still trying to recuperate our energy and, you know, get ready for next spring. Um, I don't know, but yeah, definitely um, it's a it's a struggle every time I have to go feed the animals. And, and I do it because I have to and... I don't enjoy it as much as I would like in the summer or, you know, in fall or even in spring. Uh, Mountain Roots brought up a good point. And I know, Chris, you've touched on it. I, I've touched on it before um, <coughs> about watering animals in the winter. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is a lot of animals can get by without having a water trough. Mm -hmm. They, a lot of them like chickens who are able to eat the snow, um, our highlands, you know, if there's snow on the hay or snow on their feed, they're ingesting that as well for the moisture, for the liquid, um, rabbits, it, rabbits, the same thing. It's one the of those where we find that doesn't do super well with it is the, uh, the horses, they, the two right. ponies, they have Our horses have will just die anyway they're like <laughs> you know if, if they're not pampered then usually they're uh i think they're yeah they're one of those strange animals that uh yeah but yeah everything else even the sheep in the winter um when you've got a good when the snow's not that hard crusty snow when it's still the light fluffy snow right. we have some individuals in the herd that they almost it to water like you give them water and it just all freezes right um, the chickens do fine with it and we actually do always switch to doing the rabbits that way too unless you have a really big group we find if we've still got like a big grow out group we can't get enough snow into the uh into the hutch to keep them all happy so we usually end up yep. watering them but when they're when we're just down to like single adults in a in a hutch then it's not so bad I can't yeah, wait till next year too. or th this year when we get everything kind of sorted out. We're going to get the chicken coop going again. And I've already got my overflow from my well because it's artesian. So I'm going to divert that and make a creek that's always flowing for the, the animals. And I hopefully I won't have to water anything any, ever again. It just self-contained. <laughs> I'm building water that habitat. constantly. <laughs> just, just don't get ducks because the ducks will muck it up <laughs> yes yes i can't i can't do ducks no uh although now thanks to um my wife i may end up with a mini highland cow one of these days <sighs> <laughs> that'll muck up your water too <laughs> Great. Great. Yes. I look forward to that. <laughs> but yeah. What about you, Chris? Anything you dread during winter? I don't know if it's a complete dread, but I, I really don't like the freeze thaw. And I know I'm kind of on a different wavelength than the rest of you for that because we just seem to sit on that line now, which historically we didn't. <laughs> historically we got proper winters but uh, it seems more often than not we don't have the nice winters like Dave gets down in real south southwestern Ontario but we don't have 
the nice cold winters either. So we're kind of in this weird flux. And we actually find that's that's the hardest on everything. Because if it gets cold and it stays cold, everything is okay with it, provided you've got some snow. If it stays warm, you, you can find things that are okay with it. But when you get these crazy temperature swings and the rain, the snow, the, you know, everything in between in like a 24 hour period, it's not dread. It's just, it's hard because there's not very much that can take all of that. Yeah. No, I think that's what killed off our apples uh, a couple of years back. Cause we had a freeze thaw and it, it destroyed all the apples around here. Yeah, that's very likely if they woke up at all. Yeah. We've noticed that, <sighs> again, talking about biannual plants, that uh, our best year with the seed so far from the kale was we actually covered it with uh, like a plastic vapor barrier. So it didn't matter. The, cold, the temperature wasn't the problem, but we had one raised bed where it was covered with the plastic and one raised bed where it wasn't. Both of them had a bit of mulch because we were really trying to make sure we got plants to go to seed. In the bed that didn't have the plastic, because we kept getting the free saw, free saw, free saw, the mulch and everything just got soaked and the plants just rotted in there. Mm -hmm. Whereas even though same temperature exposure, the ones that were covered did amazing. So it, that's something to think about too, like... If the plants are sort of marginally hardy in your area, that free saw will probably kill them faster or be harder on them than if you just got the snow cover and then they were insulated. Yeah, definitely. I know we ran into the problem too last year. Uh, we had that early, early spring uh, and then cold snap. So all our apple trees and pear trees and everything started blooming and then cold snap That's so better. the bees weren't actually out yet none of the um pollinating insects were out yet so none of the trees got pollinated that we could tell like we had yeah. four apples maybe and the year before you know we had like 20 they're just they're all young trees but still it was a mm -hmm. you, you notice the big difference in that uh does anyone in the comments questions anyone watching have comments or questions <laughs> anything you want to ask anyone on the panel at all or anything you guys want to interject or comment on or mention i was hoping to harvest a deer this year and i tracked and tracked and found the right spot and and had everything set up went out and cleared a bit you know so i'd have good sight lines <sighs> then the storms hit and blew trees down in all the paths that the deers you know deer would take to get to that part of the property so i went out there and figured it out and i would have to go probably i don't know an acre and a half back at least through heavy bush just to get back into the the deer tracks <laughs> so i wasn't able to get anything this year <sighs> it's so. uh it really makes a difference i noticed being able to put uh a deer or two deers or anything oh, like yeah. that into the freezer to be able to provide some meat for the winter yeah definitely yeah i was uh was lucky enough to have them like quarter of a moose and half a deer and it makes all the difference in the world uh, whenever we don't know what to do for supper or, or lunch uh, we'll put out a steak and you know french fries or squash or whatever kind of food we have in the freezer and just have a nice steak I, this, is, I, this is where i'm the odd one out because i definitely appreciate hunting definitely appreciate um the wild game that sort of thing but it's for me it's it's the unpredictability of it yeah. right the, the more time you have the more access to a larger area you have and, I, and i'm making generalizations but that can make or break whether you get something right like if you if you are lucky enough to be able to travel around all of ontario for example and 
go to different areas and and you know spend x amount of weeks hunting for deer and for then for moose and whatever again um then it's great because you 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 convert that time into the guarantee that you'll get it but if if you can't do that whether it's because of work or whatever then it's it's hard to to bank it's, it's hard to bank on it then yeah yeah definitely Sorry, Mud made a comment. <laughs> it was just funny. Journal. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Rem about um, having food accessible at night, and it just kind of brought up the thought. We had um, potato leek soup that we canned the other night, and we only started canning uh, really uh, a year ago and it's making all the difference in the world for those days that, you know, you forgot to take something out of the freezer or don't have anything planned. You can go downstairs and grab some soup or some chili or some canned meat or something like that. And you've basically got an instant meal. Like it's fast food homestead meal and it's just ready to go. You just got to heat it up or, cook it with something else. And it, to me, it's just awesome. It makes all the difference in the world being able to do that. It's good for you. Fast food. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But de yeah. definitely agree. It takes a little bit of planning to, to stock it, but it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed the transition because when I go travel and, and visit family back home, I, I tend to like pick up, you know, fast food along the way. Cause I'm driving like eight hours. Um, and when I get back, it's, I might as well set off M eighties in my stomach. It's just, it's a wreck. <laughs> like I'm not used to that anymore. And so it, yeah, I get back to eating right. And it's just, I, everything works. Yeah, it's it's very true though. But I always find it funny because I think we were talking about this last or earlier this week. I'm, it's like rabbits. You'll read things about rabbits, and people will say, "Oh, don't feed them green food because they'll they'll bloat and they'll die." And it's like, but exactly what Mike said. Every animal usually has to get used to whatever it's eating. So if you're not used to eating fast food. All of a sudden, you eat a whole bunch of it. Of course, why would you not expect it? <laughs> X, Y, and Z yeah. to you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I saw uh, Scrambles had a question about greenhouses. Where was it here? It's a good one. Um, oh, yeah. Right here. Yeah. Do any of you have, have greenhouses over winter and how much luck for yields? Uh, our greenhouse, uh, we've got a big one, but uh, it's not heated. Uh, it's passive solar. Basically, we're still working on ironing out the details, uh, but we don't. It it's usually finished. Uh, this year was finished like the start of November. Nothing, nothing we could take after that. Um, it just doesn't get enough heat at night, and I've still got to insulate the roof. And then I think I'm going to put another plastic layer of plastic on the uh, one side of it to try and keep some of that hot air in. Uh, I want to put in some more water barrels as well to see if that'll help retain more heat. Um, we put some concrete blocks in. We're going to put a bunch more in this year, again, to try and help retain some of the heat going into the evenings. So hopefully that'll stretch it out a bit longer as well. And the same thing for me. It gets way too cold in the winter. Um, unless you have something heated, it's pointless. We've got a greenhouse that I think we had a few things still surviving in it up until the beginning of November this year. But uh, it's not completely airtight. So unless you have the sun... And we built it that way on purpose because it's not really meant to be sort of full year round use. We've got we've got a plan for something that would extend our seasons, but it still wouldn't be a proper greenhouse. But we'll, we'll see if that happens before next uh, next fall. 
That's actually got a, I've got a question for you guys. Cause I've been kicking around a few ideas for the greenhouse off the side of the house. And I was thinking about putting a couple courses of ICF block all the way around the bottom of it as like a foundation. Um, but mainly for more heat retention over the winter. Um, do you think that was, that would be a big benefit or do you think that it's just all the heat would rise up and, and leak out the top anyway? Are you going down with that sort of foundation or just kind of, um, well, it's already like almost into the side of a hill right now. So where the house is, I've already dug out about 12 feet, uh, into the side of a hill. So I have all that earth that I could use if I took it right up into the hill. Okay. Because I don't have experience with this, but I have seen that design where it's lower, right? And then you've got earth. So if you went down into it and then your top's going to be greenhouse, but um, it might ha it might work. I mean, it would definitely keep your frost from coming through the wall at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Something's better than nothing. Yeah, and even if you come up two feet above ground with it, that'll help as well. Um, and then what I saw my buddy out west do, out in Calgary, the one I got my greenhouse design from, he actually laid down, he dug down and basically did his own geothermal heating. So he dug down and laid some pipes in the ground and then brought the pipes up either end so that you'd get that kind of air circulation going on throughout the day and throughout the evening as well. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. There's, de there's definitely ways to do it. Yeah. Um, but again, if you're attaching it to the house as well, uh, are you planning on using some of the house heat at night or through the winter? I haven't quite decided. I'm still kicking yeah. around a few ideas because I've got a couple, uh, you know, spare wood stoves hanging about that I could probably put in there. Um, but I mean, as with everything around here, you're trying to make it as self-sustaining as possible, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the whole idea that we kind of built that around is it's we've got a door entry that will go to the greenhouse right near the kitchen so that she can access it. And we're going to try and use it all winter long. Nice. I mean, that's, that's the plan. We'll see if we can get there. The good thing of building off the house is there's one wall. You don't have to worry about insulating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apparently the wife has boss. already decided it will be warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The boss will. <laughs> <laughs> the gods have spoken yeah. <laughs> apparently there is a plan <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've often said I am not the planner around here I'm just the, the slave labor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it also depends a little bit to what you're planning to grow over the winter right yeah. If you're like in an ideal world, I think we would all love to have a indoor growing space. We could actually have like lemon trees and tropical plants and that sort of thing. I'm going to say it this way. That's going to be a lot harder than a space that you could grow some of those cooler season things like lettuce and, and kale and, you know, that kind of stuff that you're, it's like the difference between, taking the edge off and maintaining tropical conditions all the time. Right. So that uh, may be something to, I know Dave just recently did a video about his greenhouse and he still had lettuce going on in his greenhouse. I'm Dave, if you're still there, what do you know what temperature you lost the lettuce at? Like how, what kind of, uh, how low when temperature did the greenhouse get where, the lettuce was no longer viable for you because i think it would it'll do frost no problem right mild frost mild frost yeah. okay kale kale and, and the brassicas can take a bit heavier frost um 
does depend a bit on the type of lettuce too. There are some that are hardier. Nah, right. But yeah. there's so many kinds of lettuce. Some of that's trial and error. <laughs> right, right. And I know he did ask in the, the chat there that um, he was saying I should have put packs in the floor and used the stove to heat the water. I do have the water jacket in the stove and it will be heating my water. But um, as far as I'm aware, the way I've got it set up, it's going to be gravity fed. So I'm going to have a tank higher than the stove so that it'll self circulate. What I can do from there, though, is I can run pipes uh, through the floor joist and down and into the, uh, the greenhouse when it's ready. But to do that, I would have to have a pump in there, like even a 12-volt pump to, to circulate the water. So it's still a possibility. I could still pull it off. It's just a little bit more work. Yeah. The other thing we're looking at doing, too, for ours is I was told – even throwing a compost pile in a greenhouse will help heat. heat yeah. So I'm going to yeah. kind of take one section and create a little compost pile inside the greenhouse. So I can, the, that's what I'm thinking. The only problem is, is half the time we're taking the compost and giving it to the chickens in the winter for them to eat and scratch around in and that sort of thing. So it's like, you know, you get to the point where, the compost could go in the greenhouse. It could go to the chickens. In the summer, we give it to the pigs. Um, you know, we sometimes dump it in the food forest. Other times, it goes in the outdoor compost. If I keep throwing it all those different locations, I'm not going to really get – not going to achieve anything that I need to achieve. I need to pick one and focus. Don't, like, don't fall in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what you can do though is if you guys are still on the agenda to get the goats yeah yeah because right now like the way you have the highland cattle the yeah. perk to them is they can be out so you don't like for us this is one thing I, and i know it's ponies but it's one thing we like about the ponies and the sheep is we actually between our biggest group of sheep and the ponies we we alternate the two big stalls so that we can reduce Sounds bad, but it isn't. We can reduce the cleaning frequency because the ponies are the messiest. Yeah. Once yeah. they've been in there, you've got to do a pretty good clean. But that means we always have quite a bit to go to the compost pile. Now the chickens are free range when the snow when when they will go out through the snow. They'll walk around the snow, but when it gets too deep, they won't. But so they eat out of it quite a bit still. But set up your goat barn. So that you have a bedding that you clean out every couple of days because the goats okay. won't want to be, because you were talking about getting alpine goats. I think yeah. it was, right? They'll go outside, but they won't want to be outside like the, oh, like the, yeah. the cows. So if you're using, um, I don't know how readily available like wood chip shavings and stuff yeah. are, or whether no you problem. can make your own, but if you're using that as a bedding for them, rather than let it accumulate to be a deep, deep bedding, you do the opposite where you just have enough to absorb the liquid and that sort of thing and yep. then scrape it all out take the so same as the steps. horses basically eh? but on a bit smaller scale right yeah. because you're not dealing with the same volume but that yeah. might yeah. be enough if you keep it close enough that it's not a, a laborious task to the greenhouse that might be enough to keep that going and then you're not really diverting it from something else that's true that's true because it will still generate the heat right once That's a good idea. Yeah. Now, with our our goats, they loved being outside, even in the middle of winter. The only times they, they would go inside is when it was raining. But they slept inside. Oh, they slept inside for sure. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. You'd always have that indoor space to clean versus yeah. versus the cows that don't. <laughs> no, they don't do that, right? Yeah. Uh... Oh, that's how long his uh, his lettuce lasts. For the lettuce, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, did he have styrofoam in the raised bed box or something? Or Dave's got it under the box. Under so, the box. Yeah. Okay. It's a, good, it's a good idea because, like you said, it keeps the frost from it keeps that insulation underneath the plants. So it's basically like a raised bed with the styrofoam under it. Okay. Interesting. 
maybe you could probably even go one step further if you wanted and insulate the whole raised bed or at least the sides that were to the outside of the which if you if you use the blocks like you're talking you would have that anyways Mm -hmm. i know i've got a bunch left over and right now i've just got them packed in behind the the trailer as uh, an extra insulation wall because all the heat's on one side of the barn so it doesn't really circulate well um i do have a fan blowing on it now so that's the circulation's better uh but yeah i still have air leaks and stuff off that wall it gets kind of cold last year i was fighting uh the the water freezing i haven't had any issues with it this year though so that's okay. good yeah the other thing is if you can get concrete blocks and have enough room you can build your raised bed out of the concrete blocks and that'll mm -hmm. help retain a lot of the heat as well from the day. Cool. All right. Awesome. Any final comments, guys? <laughs> <It's a spring. laughs> well, I don't have much to say except that. Like I, well, in the winter, the only two things I can do really to provide food for my family, like I, I could always plant some stuff inside. Like I've done it in the past where I was, uh, I bought one of those uh, planter where you could like hang some uh, like uh, tomato, tiny tomatoes or strawberries upside down in the window. In the window. Uh, that worked pretty well. Uh, but beside that, all I can do is uh, like go ice fishing, but it's not cold enough yet and uh go like put some snares for rabbits and stuff like that but yeah all i, I, I would I, say because you were you were complaining about it being too cold or too dark you know what it's like everything in life this too yep. shall pass yep. having a great day this too shall pass <laughs> having a, a horrible day this okay. too shall pass yeah very very true <laughs> but the wine is good Oh, it makes it all better. Actually, I got a couple of bottles of wine out there. I had tea tonight. <clears throat> nice. I just had you're water. Being, uh, <laughs> you're being a nice guy. Trying to uh, make my goals happen. So, there you if go. you haven't seen that, I'm. My goal is to drink less in 2023. So I, I did see that. Yeah. So we're all well on our way to uh, starting a new year. <laughs> all the things that we want yes. to start have yep. happened. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. All righty, guys. Well, thank you all for coming in, watching this. We really appreciate everything. Thanks for the comments, the questions. And um, I'm sure one of us will be having probably uh round table next week maybe the week <laughs> after i wonder who yeah so be sure to stay tuned for the next round table anyway guys thanks yes. again we'll talk to you soon <laughs> hey everyone take care thanks guys <laughs>